Hey everybody, uh, welcome to another Rackspace Office Hours Hangout. So I'm Alan Bush and I'm broadcasting live from the castle, Rackspace's headquarters here in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we've got a special guest host with us today, Martin Smith. How you doing, Martin? Good, how are you today? Uh, doing really good, doing really good. I'm, I'm really glad that we have you on. Uh, we had you on, uh, I don't know, about a month, month and a half ago. Um, uh, great guest and uh, had an opportunity to bring you back again and uh, really glad that you were able to help us out on short notice. I'm excited to, to talk about GitHub. I will actually wear a GitHub t-shirt for the... Uh... Nice. Nice. I, I, uh, I don't have one, actually, so I'm going to need to find one. I've got, got one for my son, but uh, it's a little small on me, so uh, you're welcome that I didn't wear that one. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's great. Yo, we're talking about GitHub today, and it's something that we've recommended that a lot of our, uh, our customers and, and viewers uh, check out and, and to use... Um, uh, to use some type of a um, you know source code repository and uh, to kind of track changes and uh, make deploying a little bit easier and uh, we've never really gotten a chance to talk about it in depth and so hopefully we'll get to do that today um, and hopefully that anybody that's watching uh, live can uh, join in and chat with us. We're definitely going to be talking about uh, you know Git GitHub give a little bit of an overview of GitHub so that we can talk a little bit about. Um, uh, you know what it is if, if you don't know uh, but then we're going to jump in and talk about kind of some of the ways that you can get started using GitHub and, and I think we'll finish up Martin you can share a little bit about how uh, you use GitHub in your day-to-day uh, -day life as a uh, DevOps engineer here at Rackspace. That sounds great that sounds like a good plan. Yeah um, so anybody that is watching live we want to encourage you to uh, communicate with us we'd love to uh, chat and hear what you have to say there's a couple of different ways that you can join us um, so we've been using a really interesting new uh, system uh, crowdcast.io and it allows us to uh, actually integrate all in the single pane so you can comment you can uh, ask questions and, and uh, answer polls and things like that so uh, if you're watching live just log in and, and uh, chat that way uh, hit us up on Twitter. We've both got our Twitter handles here. We'd be more than happy to to uh, interact with you that way as well. Um, all right, so uh, let's let's talk about it a little bit. Um, Martin, let's uh, introduce you. I mean, you you've been on before, but uh, maybe we've got some new viewers that are catching you this time. So you've been a racker for a little over two years, I think. Just right about it, two years. Um, and the whole time I've I've been in uh, Rackspace's DevOps practice area. Uh, so they're the the main sort of product. Thing I work on a lot is the DevOps automation service where we will uh, work with a customer to basically automate their entire infrastructure and manage it with sort of DevOps best practices and principles. So um, I, do, I do a lot of uh, contributing back to the community and the rest of the world, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in relation to GitHub, but um, also get to work with customers directly. Uh, to automate their infrastructure and watch them grow, so that's that's it's been a really cool uh, thing to see. Yeah, definitely. I, I know that we've been doing a lot with uh, with customers, and uh, I think we'll get into that a little bit later. But I mean, like, GitHub is one of those tools that absolutely makes it possible. It would probably be uh, impossible without that. So I will get into that here in a, in a little bit. Um, so yeah, so let's jump in and, and just really start uh, talking about a quick overview of of GitHub now. Um, uh, we actually do have one comment already from Skip, and he wants to know uh, what's the difference between SVN and Git. And this is a great question, and I, we'll, we'll definitely get to that as we go along. But um, you know, GitHub is—it's um, not Git, right? Uh, it, it's based on Git, though, and and it is um, a uh, what? How did GitHub itself mention it? So uh, they say it's an uh, Git itself is an open source program that tracks changes uh, in text files, right? And um, Martin, maybe you can talk a little bit about how it specifically differs from um, SVN, other um, uh, management software like that. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, you might also be familiar with CVS before Subversion, which is SVN. That's what we're talking about, uh, the, the full name Subversion. Um, and really, there's a history of software like this going back a, a long time. but. Um, the interesting thing about Git relative to Subversion, I would say, is that uh, Git is really designed for uh, sort of a distributed environment and um, being able to work offline. You know, it, it, in the days where Subversion was really popular, uh, you kind of had to be connected to the network to use it. You couldn't really work on your own and uh, do your own thing and then... Um, you know, be on a plane writing code and then get touchdown, check it out. You'd have to get back on the network, get it all back in. 
Um, and, and Git is really, you know, it was uh, Linus Torvalds, the, the guy that manages the Linux kernel, um, it's sort of his brainchild, and you can see that it's optimized for that kind of workflow, which is uh, everyone with separate, um, separate copies of the code and submitting changes back in a distributed way, and the idea that maybe there's a few people merging changes back into their own copies. So it's much more of a distributed model, but I would say, too, it shouldn't scare you away. You can definitely use it like Subversion as well. You can treat it like very much like Subversion. Great, great. Yeah, that's uh, that. That I think that is the that main key there, where it's meant to be uh, done in a distributed way, and that's really um, uh, that's kind of really where a lot of uh, coding is going right now. And we see a lot of people that are working um, not just on uh, you know on on a single team with a whole bunch of different people, but um, all the way across the globe, and they're working with people. I mean, you're you're sitting in your home in uh, in Florida and. Uh, uh, you know, we, we can collaborate. You can collaborate with your teammates here in San Antonio and customers that are elsewhere. And it's really built for that. It's um, it's really a collaborative tool. Um, it allows people to collaborate and not get in each other's way, uh, which is really nice. Um, for sure, and I think that's probably one of the reasons it's indistinguishable from GitHub is that uh, GitHub is also kind of built as a collaboration space. So sometimes the line is is definitely blurred between the two tools. Right. Uh, so you have. Um, it's like we froze up there. I <laughs> hope, hope you're still there. Uh, so yeah, it looks like um, uh, Git uh, Hub is is really a, a kind of a front end for uh, for Git. I mean, you can run uh, Git on your uh, on your machine on your local machine as a um, uh, you know as a uh, as a command line tool. Right. Uh, there are a couple of other front ends I'm sure that are that are not quite as popular as GitHub. Uh, itself, um, but uh, you know, I mean, GitHub seems to be the one that has the most uh, crit critical mass behind it, and a lot of people are are on there. Uh, you you uh, put into our kind of show notes before a couple of really interesting stats, and uh, I'd like to have you go over those since looks like we got you back there. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I guess it's an unlucky day for for the internet somewhere. Um, yeah. So their their slogan is build better, build software better together. Um, which is kind of, if you think about everything they do, tends to go towards some sort of social collaboration. You can comment on practically anything in GitHub. Sharing everything is the default. Um, and that's probably why these stats are so big. They have more than 10 million users right now and 25 different repositories. And, and that could be code. That could be um, almost any text-based anything, a collaborative book. Uh, I found some people collaborating on a font design there, like just about anything. Um, and so I, to me, 10 million users for a company that started in 2008, um, every time I look, their stats are bigger, sometimes doubled. So I thought that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you mentioned that it's just grown more than double since the last time you, you, you look at it, so that's good. Uh, yeah, 25 million different repositories. That's a lot of repositories. Um, yeah, you mentioned some of the interesting uh, uses there and, and designing fonts. One thing that I think is, is interesting that Rackspace has used it in a couple of uh, a couple of different ways um, is, um, uh, first of all, the, the, the company policies, right? So um, we actually have uh, our social media guidelines um, available on GitHub, and we put those there not just because it's easy to have a couple of different collaborators um, you know, edits on them uh, in a distributed team, but because we want people to actually use it, and um, it's been forked 11 times, and uh, so that means other people are using, uh, or, or potentially are using it. Uh, you know, they might be forking it through uh, to merge uh, uh, later, but you know, it's uh, if people are using uh, these guidelines to, you know, build their own off of, and, and that's that's uh, really an open source uh, kind of an ethos, and I'm glad that we've been able to to bring that in. Yeah, I mean, it's gotten to the point for me where if I think of an interesting software project, like, hey, let me go try this, the first place I look is, is GitHub because I think surely somebody has done this. Um, that, that happened to me just the other day with my, uh, I've got one of those learning thermostats, and I thought it'd be nice to have some data collection on how efficient my AC unit is. And sure enough, there was somebody had written a project on GitHub, fancy graphs, the whole nine yards, and it, I could fix parts of it and contribute it back. 
Yeah, that's um, uh, th- that's really interesting too because it's one of those things where it's not just a, you know, we live in the age of, of search, you know, and so it's, it's able to do that. But I mean, it's not just a a dumping ground for a bunch of code. It's something that's meant to be searched, meant to be uh, meant to be found. You know, uh, uh, what are the? I, I I think this is a Google thing where they they said that the um, uh, they said that uh, YouTube is the number two search engine, right behind Google itself. And uh, people go straight to YouTube, and I imagine that that searches on GitHub are are pretty uh, pretty common as well. Yeah, um, that's great. So so uh, let's talk just a real quick o- about kind of how um, GitHub itself works, just to make sure that we can kind of uh, give the the baseline use cases. So a lot of times it works with. Um, uh, software seems to be like the main thing that people are, are using on GitHub. So let's take a, a kind of like a baseline software project and talk about how, um, you know, how that might work for somebody. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so as we mentioned, it's a website, right? So you can open it in your browser, go to it, and you can also interact with it uh, with Git, that, that command line tool. So... Um, what a lot of people are having in trying to write a new software project or maybe move a software project to GitHub do is they go and they uh, create a repository through the web interface and um, then they go back to their command line and push that code to that repository and uh, you can see in Alan's example here they sharing a, a web view of that repository and, and GitHub has some nice features you can already see here. Um, one that's really heavily used is Markdown uh, if you put a Markdown file uh, in inside of a Git repository and send it to GitHub, uh, upload it to GitHub, you can actually view that Markdown not just as the source, but as the um, actual as the actual formatted text. So uh, usually that's the first thing people do is they put a README on a project and they they use Markdown, and um, after that they start to just put code in it, take code out, uh, commit their changes track the different versions that are there. It also has some other tools like an issue tracker. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can also watch other people and see what work they do on your project and submit changes back to another project. So those are sort of the baseline use cases. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so, so you mentioned a couple of things. I want to uh, make sure that we uh, define them, the, you know, uh, how they work. So you said um, you commit changes, right? So that is when you when you make changes on your local machine, right? So you you check out the code, you you download it to your uh, local machine, or it might already be there, right? But uh, you you actually make the changes, and you can save it as many times as you want. It's not something that's saving back to a central location every single time you make a change. You make those changes on your own, and then once you're ready to go, that's when you hit commit. You synchronize it back up with, uh, with, with GitHub itself, and then it's there for other people to use. That's right, and, and also that's often a selling point of Git over something like Subversion uh, that we were discussing before is that um, everyone has a full copy of all of the code. So it's not unlike Subversion in the sense that usually you put a server out somewhere and you want it backed up. Really, if GitHub were to go down, presumably everyone has a copy of their code already, um, unless you've deleted it off of your computer. But if you're working on it at all, you have the entire history. So that's, a, that's a big selling point for Git. There we go. Hey, uh, that's absolutely one of the one of the selling points there. Um, beyond that, you know, you also have um, uh, the ability then to to fork that code, right? So um, if you want to make changes that you are either going to contribute back to the project that you're working on, or you know, branch off and make your own changes, a lot of the projects are licensed for that. You know, specifically for people to, to branch off of them and create their own projects. So talk a little bit about how th- that forking process and then the merging back in. Sure. Um, so actually, it's, it's one of the things I love about it, too, is that I can work on something, um, and GitHub actually will notify me when somebody makes a fork of my project, which is to say they go in and they and GitHub makes it very easy. They just hit a button that says fork, um, and it makes them a copy of the code in that repository that they own. Um, and so they can change it, edit it, go back, mess with it, do whatever they want to it, delete it all, commit everything, and it doesn't affect my copy. It's basically completely their copy separately. Um, and they can request that, that changes from that for be added back to my original repository, but they don't have to. I mean, at that point, um, 
the forking the the process of forking really kind of separates into a whole new repository. Um, and it's really cool to even to see when people fork a, a repository. Uh, you know, in in part of the work I do for Rackspace, I get to um, do some Elasticsearch log stash and Kibana sort of uh, work, and I I have a Chef cookbook to automate it. And you you go and you see people fork it, and they go and they take it and they use it for something. And it's like if you have an interesting project. Uh, one way to see how interesting is how many people have forked it, because that means there's a lot of interest in it. And you can actually go to GitHub and look at their top uh, fork projects, which is really interesting. Um, oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, take a look at those. Um, so, so once something is forked, you can also fork it to make a change that'll be contributed back in. So not just to split off and make a whole different uh, version of it, but you can actually then bring in those changes. That would be uh, once you make those changes, then you do a pull request, right? That's right, and really that is GitHub sort of replacing an earlier era where people had changes and they just emailed them. Um, so back before there were tools like Git Hub, even with Git, you could just send your changes by email. And in fact, the Git tool still has um, functions in it to take email and, and apply changes from email that, that are still in there. But, but yeah, the idea is, uh, which I really think is great, is that you can actually see someone else's request for changes, which is a whole new dimension on um, contributing back to open source, is not only do you know when you've requested a change, but I can go and find that another project had a fix submitted, and I can say, this is great, I want this too. And even if it doesn't get accepted into the main project, I can use it. Well, and you could use it, or you could say, hey, I was about to do that same thing, and you know, either add just a little additional bit to that, or you know, in, in some uh, larger projects where people um, you know, collaborate and vote on different changes, things like that, you can you know, use that to add your voice to the people that are pushing to get that, that in there. That's right, and I even the other day uh, went to a project where someone had submitted a bunch of code changes and no documentation, and the project said, we need documentation, and I wrote the documentation, so I submitted it back as a pull request and said, take what they submitted and my documentation and merge this together, and uh, I was able to contribute to a project, didn't even have to write any code, really, um, but you know, I was still able to help that change make it back into the original software project. And, and that's a great point. There are so many projects that need help in so many different ways that aren't just uh, contributing code. I mean, almost every project needs documentation. Um, no, and I'll say that every project needs documentation. And uh, the, the better the documentation is, the better that project's going to go. Uh, whether that's a, you know, a, a simple little microservice or, or you know, some giant uh, project like OpenStack, right, that, that this is very, so if you're not a coder and you want to help out a project, though, that's a great way to do it. And it's a great way to learn uh, about the project and, and, you know, eventually get to the point where you're adding some code. And even just to get comfortable with Git or GitHub, it's right. a it's a great way to do that. Is to just find the examples that a project has for how to use it. You know, it's hard to keep up examples and documentation sometimes, and that's a great contribution is to fix those for somebody. Yep, absolutely. Um, so we have a, a another comment or a question from Skip, and he asks if he can get, we can get a couple of examples of how this works. And I think we have one that's uh, ready to go. I go here, um, but I want to encourage anybody else that's watching, if you have a question or a comment, there's a couple of different ways that you can submit those. You can submit it through the crowdcast.io application uh, that you're likely watching us on. You can go ahead and just uh, drop a comment into the uh, comments area, and we're happy to, to work with you. Uh, Martin and I also have our uh, Twitter uh, handles here, so just to hit us up on Twitter, that works as well. Um, so uh, let's go ahead, and, and I'm going to share my screen here. So this is... Um, this is the, uh, I, I've created a repository for the Office Hours Hangout, right? And I've got one for uh, this show that we're doing right now. So I've got some show notes on this. And uh, over the last week or so, we've been putting this together. And, um, you know, I, I wrote a little bit, and then, Martin, you forked it. Did you fork it, or did you just get it straight from the, uh, straight from the web? I did fork it, and, and the, the reason for that actually is that um, one of the ways to control access to projects in GitHub is to is to require people to make a fork. Uh, that way I can't put code on, on as a branch in your repository. So, so yes, I did make a fork of it. Yeah, 
That, so yeah, so yeah, you, so Martin forks it and then uh, makes some changes on it. And, and we mentioned this is written in Markdown, which looks uh, like this whenever you're writing. Yeah, so here it is right... Oop, I just went back. So it, uh, it looks like this. So um, it looks very similar to the uh, regular text that, that you would see, but it has uh, some of these uh, items like uh, like hashtags to change the the heading, uh, you know, little stars for uh, list objects. Uh, very simple to use, and I, I really strongly recommend that everybody learn how to do it because it's a great uh, great way to easily jot down your notes. So so anyway, so uh, Martin adds a little bit in Git down or <laughs> Git down <laughs> GitHub uh, adds some Markdown to the uh, GitHub repository. There we go and then sends me a pull request, right? So um, uh, he does that by checking it in, and uh, because there is a change, right? That's one of the things that GitHub looks at, or Git in general looks at, is the diff, the difference between uh, the first version and this next version, and, it, and it'll tell you what they are. Um, so he actually made another change here just yesterday, or just today, just 32 minutes ago, and so I'm going to take a look at it. So we're going to head and take a look at this uh, pull request right here. And... Yeah, so basically there, there's not much at all uh, that changed, right? Just this link was, was updated. It'll show what has actually been updated. Um, he dropped in a little bit of information on what that was, which is great because it lets me know what's changed. Um, if it's going to be a larger section of code, there's going to be more uh, information on it than just, you know, hey, I fixed something. You know, that's the kind of being polite about it. Got to make sure that you uh, let people know what you're doing. And so now... Uh, I get this big green check mark because it doesn't create any issues, right? If I had made some changes that conflicted with this, I would have something different. Uh, what would that look like, Martin? Uh, so that would actually look like a, it would be grayed out, and it would say um, it would actually give you the command line instructions to copy and paste for how to test my changes and merge them in with what else has been changed. Um, additionally, I have the option as a submitter to go and notice that and then go update my changes so that they don't conflict with yours. So um, Git knows that I worked on my commit before other changes were made. Uh, so I can actually go back and say, well, take off my changes, update to the latest, and then reapply my changes, and I can fix any conflicts. So, so either the person receiving the request or the person sending the request can, can fix that, uh, which, which is really nice because you can also go and fix somebody else's and resubmit it, you know, if you're working on a team and try, trying to help out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I've got a couple of options here. I can I can uh, close it out and leave a comment saying, you know, hey, we're not going to do this or something, or, or I can go ahead and, and merge it. So I am going to go ahead and uh, merge that. Ask me to confirm it because this is, you know, potentially a, a large piece of uh, software that will break a whole bunch of things if it uh, goes wrong. And I went ahead and merged it. So there we go. Now it's in, and now the um, uh, now th that uh, file has been updated. And you can see in here too um, that really in a lot of other version control systems like Subversion, CVS, and and more, um, they often people had to go get a GUI for them, right? And mm -hmm. and use some tools. And and actually, GitHub itself makes a great uh, Git uh, GUI utility for Windows, which I encourage you to check out if you know if you if you think that um, they don't do software development on clients, they definitely do and they're they actually their Windows client is amazing. Um, but but it's this like like you're showing here, you can see the diff. Um, whereas in Subversion you'd have to remember the command to, to type out. You'd have to remember um, you know what the previous version was. You might have to go ask questions. And whereas in this UI, you can even comment on my change and say, Martin, why did you, uh, why did you use a comma here? Which is actually really something that, that is a lot slower without a tool like GitHub. Right. Yep. Absolutely. So yeah, uh, so I'm going to zoom in here so we can all see it. Um, but yeah, it shows exactly what happened. So we it essentially subtracted the line here. Uh, that had a uh, was missing the HTTP, and then we added in a new line, same thing, uh, but added in that one right there with the HTTP colon slash slash, and there we go. So uh, very very easy to uh, to fix that there. Shows you exactly what was changed, and so you, you see that um, in each of the uh, history places there, and you can also go back and um, roll back. So I'd be able to go back and roll back if if I find out. 
you know, 20, 30 minutes later, oh, hey, this was bad, this uh, ruined everything, I can fix it. So uh, I don't have to worry about that. All right. Let's see. Great. Yeah. So that was. So that's what we did. Um. And and that's. Uh. You know. We're we're getting pretty meta by uh, doing the uh, the show notes on GitHub. Show notes about GitHub on GitHub. But uh, it's a it's a good way to kind of visualize that. Um. You know. When you start working with additional, uh, especially in, in in software, and this is where we really uh start to recommend it to our uh to our customers. Um. I recommend it a lot on the launch team. You'd have people that were running uh, fairly complex software environments, and they would go through and they would need to make a change. And so they would go through and they would make the change on their production server and it would be, you know, it would either work or not work. And if it didn't work, it would be bad because it would take everything down. So we would say, hey, why don't you go ahead and, um, uh, you know, spin up a development environment and test it out. Um, so the idea then would be that you would create also a branch of uh, your Git repository and test out those, uh, you know, on a development or testing staging branch um, before you merge that back into your production environment, your your master environment, however you have that uh, configured. And so yeah, that, that's work. right. And and Git also, that that's not something to, to think about lightly either. It makes uh, passing around pieces of, of code really easy. So you get to the point where when you when you start to use it a lot, you know, when I when I work with the other colleagues in the DevOps practice area, I often say, oh, you fix that, I'm gonna pull that into to my branch. And then they say, oh, I really like how you how you did this while before I go get the latest copy, I'm gonna go pull your change in or hey I, can I submit a change on top of yours that fixes the one last thing. I fixed it while you were out yesterday, you know. You really start to pass around code really easily, which is just something that if, if you ever did that in the subversion days was was not fun and required a central server. Yeah, absolutely. I, that, that's one of the things uh, as well. You know, I, I started off at Rackspace on the launch team and worked with brand new customers and uh, people that weren't as familiar with GitHub itself or, or, or Git even would. Um, you know, start off and say, hey, the first thing I need to spin up is a subversion server so that I can, you know, then pull that information onto my other servers that I'm working on. And, uh, you know, while we certainly encourage people to spin up more servers here at Rackspace, it might not be the most economical use of, of all of their resources, especially if you're on a budget. So this is a nice, uh, it's free for public repositories, uh, it's starting at like $7 a month, I think, to make them private. If you're going to, and, and that's essential if you're going to have any type of um, uh, secure data I included in that. I mean, there's um, uh, some pretty unfortunate stories about people who have um, uh, stumbled across SSH keys and passwords and things like that in public uh, GitHub repositories. And and you got also have to remember that just because it is, um, just because you have deleted it from the current version does not mean that all of those other versions are there. So you... Uh, you really got to make sure that you uh, practice some good security when you when you use GitHub on that. And they also have an enterprise sort of uh, host it yourself version, which uh, might be an option if you're if you're really really concerned about uh, keeping these secure and and on premise. Uh, and uh, you know we we use that too at Rackspace. So we among other there's and there's lots of other sites out there that that are similar or, or have some version of that between GitHub. There's GitLab. Bucket, some of those you can host yourself as well. Yep, exactly, exactly. Uh, and that's a great um, that's a great uh, transition to how does Rackspace use GitHub? So um, uh, you, you already mentioned um, a, a couple of things, but let's talk a little bit about how how we do it here at Rackspace. And um, you know, I think one of the first things that we mentioned was that we develop a lot of our internal. Um, uh, software on GitHub as well. So let's, um, you mentioned enterprise GitHub. I'm, I, I believe we have an enterprise uh, license for GitHub and um, I, we, we run it on our own. And um, uh, there's a couple of, uh, you know, nice features about that because you have uh, administration rights that can, uh, you know, allow you to add and remove new developers as they move around from project to project or inside and outside of the organization. Um, but then again, it's also, uh, it's also personal. Right, or it's also private to your uh, to your company, right? And it's not going to uh, allow any of those secrets, those those keys, and anything like that, that might be necessary for the software to to bootstrap to run whatever. 
but you can you can still have that, but not necessarily, um, you know, not necessarily expose those to the outside world. That's right, and I think also um, one thing that uh, I see a lot too is just read-only repositories. A lot of people used to um, write a script to copy their private repositories publicly if they ran a project where they needed to host a mirror somewhere else, and that's one common thing I see in Rockspace's use of GitHub is like maybe a tool for OpenStack or a particular project. Uh, they might have it on public GitHub and private GitHub, uh, do some changes on the private side, and then regularly push those up to public GitHub as a read-only mirror for people. So that's that's yet another another thing, and, and really another way people use GitHub often to distribute software or source code, um, for sure. But uh, I'll also, just to talk about some of that, how we use, uh, how Rackspace uses GitHub internally. Um, so it's funny, we're sort of a very, very open source friendly company. Um, it's a pretty big place. So actually sometimes the, the distinction between public GitHub and our internal one is just the type of software that's on it. Um, it's more about keeping something private for the tool than it is about anything else. It's the internal GitHub is a place where I can actually go and find a racker in San Francisco that wrote a tool, and I could fork it and then submit a pull request, and, and you wouldn't even know it was not on public GitHub. Um, it's just a, another place for collaboration, and, and I'd say it's just as active um, of a site. So we definitely probably use it in exactly the same way people use public uh, GitHub. Um, and in, in fact, one of the things we do a lot in the area I'm in is actually collaborate with customers on it, which is which is really cool. Um, you know, I get to sometimes review customer pull requests. A customer is learning a new tool. We might have some expertise on it. They submit a change. We help them get it to where um, it, it passes all the tests and looks good. And then they might even go and then contribute that up somewhere else to open source. So. Um, so it's really just a collaboration tool with amazing potential in that way, whether it be for uh, internal software, a customer's infrastructure, or maybe even something they want in the outside world. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that's great. So um, we did have a couple more questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, Vishnu asked about um, what happens if GitHub goes down. This is something we mentioned at the, at the top of the broadcast, I mean, right when we started. Uh, but I mean that, that's the neat thing is that since GitHub is, I mean almost just a front end. I mean there's a, certainly a, a ton of collaboration utilities on top of it, but uh, really it's a it's a um, front end for um, uh, for uh, Git itself. And so you know each of the developers will um, most of the time have the entire code base on their uh, local development platform. And so um, that's good. So so we don't have to, to do with that. And then also. Um, you know, there are the enterprise versions of GitHub, which you can self-host, right? So if github.com goes down, you might, you know, be uh, out of luck until it comes back up. But, you know, you'd at least have the ability to, um, you know, run your, your, your private version. Right. And really, um, I think Git, the one distinction to be made with, with Git versus other tools is that, uh, like Alan said, you can commit locally with Git, so you can actually create a trail of history, not just the latest change, which is what you're really only going to be able to record with Subversion. You can't actually commit it back. So um, one whole class of, of problems where user error, right? I, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to uh, work with somebody to help them re uh, reconstruct when they have accidentally used CVS or Subversion and deleted something or lost a commit. Well, with Git, at least, um, you can you can make those commits and and feel confident that they're there and safe, but short of the hard drive on your computer dying, um, and actually still retain different versions of the software. So, um, but it is a good point. Without without GitHub, the social aspect of it is greatly greatly diminished. Um, you know, and and I think that I think that people do forget that. But uh, also, if it were to go away. The, the beauty of Git is that the, the whatever the next site is, if, if GitHub shut down tomorrow, um, people would run their one command to add another location and say send the history there, and all that's restored. You know, 
Well, and I think that brings up a, a follow-up question: Is can you simultaneously have your your Git uh, repositories in GitHub and and you know say another you know upstart uh, comes along and you you could run them in parallel? I would, I would think, right? Absolutely, you can add as many remote repositories as you need to, and um, often I even just use that to add other people on GitHub their remote repositories. But it's a URL you can put in anything, and so you could even have a thing where you always push it locally to your server and then to GitHub, and that would take care take care of that. Great. Great, great. Anybody else that has questions, uh, feel free to drop us a, a comment or two. We've got a couple of different ways for you to participate, and we'd, we'd love, to, uh, love to work with you on that. Um, um, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about the, the ways that, uh, that you can kind of bring the um, – uh, that you can kind of automate this. So I think this goes a little bit more into the DevOps automation uh, aspect of, on your end. And we've talked a little bit about having, uh, you know, a development branch, uh, a testing, staging, uh, production branch. And let's talk about some of the ways that, that you can automate, um, you know, moving code in and out of those and, and pushing all of that to your production servers. Sure. Uh, actually, we have quite a few different workflows, I would say, for that. But um, what's great about GitHub is that there's a lot of integrations you can do um, so, for instance, the DevOps automation service, when I want to make a change on a customer that's using that service, um, we, I will actually clone their repo, which is to make a copy of it locally, which is different than forking it, but just to download it, its initial download of all of that information. Um, I will make my own branch, make some changes, commit them, and send that branch back up. Uh, and then what's great about GitHub is that uh, th with all those integrations, they have um, either a cloud testing platform or an internal Jenkins. For, for customers, code, it tends to be an internal Jenkins, which is a great uh, continuous integration tool. But it will actually see that I push new changes, and it will run the tests for them. And then it will go and update the branch on GitHub with a big green check mark that says, yes, this is good. Not only did Martin submit a pull request with his changes, but I tested them and they passed. Um, and then in some cases, uh, for some customers, we can actually then say, all right, then go ahead and deploy it. And uh, Jenkins will see that, and then it will go and um, bump the version that product the production server should have, and then the production servers will get that new code. And, and the whole thing is automated. You know, you're literally... Um, you're, you're literally running your infrastructure through through uh, just a few source control commands, um, and I think I think uh, Alan, you had an example of that for hosting a, a document site. GitHub does some some markdown processing that I, I think you use for a blog, right? That also has some automation behind it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, th actually, this iteration this this is one of the things that I've actually picked up from uh, from our mutual colleague. Um, uh, Justin Phelps, and he has been running a blog on, uh, he uses a tool called Pelican to take Markdown and turn it into a static HTML website, um, uh, you know, his blog. And he uses, um, I think he's on like his third or fourth different iteration of uh, tools for it, and um, uh, he's used Jenkins in the past, Tro, and I think he's on Circle CI right now. And it's one of those things where, you know, he uses GitHub, and as it's done, uh, as he, you know, uh, finishes, he'll he'll create a new branch for each time he uh, uh, writes a new post, and then he will merge that back into uh, his production, his publishing branch, and then that kicks off a uh, a series of events um, it, that actually get it published. Um, depending on where where he's going, sometimes it'll publish to a, uh, a GitHub Pages repository, which allows it to to kind of live in uh, GitHub's own hosting platform, uh, or you can uh, kick it off. Uh, mine runs uh, either on GitHub pages or on uh, Rackspace Cloud Files, a couple of different ways to, to have it all out there. So uh, it's a couple, a couple of different fun ways to, to put that out. Um, so yeah, I definitely recommend checking that out. If you and it's, a, blog. it's definitely a lesser known feature too. Not a lot of people know about that, but you can even point a domain name at GitHub um, you know, and, and they'll serve up your uh, source code as a as a bunch of documentation or pages. So that's kind of a fun little feature. 
Absolutely. I haven't put a uh, put any source code behind it yet, but I uh, did. Hang on one second. Let me share my screen here. Uh, I put together. This is one of those funny, or funny to me at least, uh, little uh, Twitter interactions that I had uh, with somebody who was going. He was in the middle of a dinner party and uh, had a uh, had awkward uh, an awkward conversation at dinner. And uh, so this, this you, you mentioned this earlier. The the power of searching. You know, hey. Uh, this is a pretty good idea. I'm sure someone else has done it. Let me see if it's there. I searched and found a uh, somebody else that had a, um, a some dinner party, or it was actually a, a meeting bingo. So if it was said, it would it would be there. But uh, these are some of the things that you might uh, end up seeing at a uh, dinner party that's uh, kind of uh, kind of going poorly. So uh, you know you might want to uh, you know mark these off as somebody talks about their uh, you know their eczema and how they're on a paleo diet and uh, you know, Obamacare or whatever you, you might find. And uh, once you get them all uh, marked off, you shout bingo and you win. So uh, just put that together. That was a simple, uh, simple matter of just, uh, you know, forking that repository, changing a little bit of the uh, types of things that were in there and, and putting them in there. But that's all served right out of, uh, right out of GitHub pages itself. So no need to, uh, to host something like that. Now, once it goes, you know, Really big and turns into a giant, uh, multi-million-dollar enterprise for me. I'll I'll uh, spin up a couple of Rackspace servers and uh, and host that, of course. So well, I hope so. I hope I look forward to that. I hope it turns into a million-dollar enterprise. That would be great. Um, and, and what's cool about that is like you don't even really if you don't want to make changes to it right away, you think you need to know something about code, not at all. With with GitHub, make an account, hit that fork button, and your blog is live, right? And, and GitHub, for the most basic kinds of changes, uh, will actually supplies a text editor inside. So um, you can actually do that uh, without ever having to mess with the command line tools yep. or like really learn much beyond creating an account and editing text on a web page. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, you just did the last uh, little change that we made to the uh, notes that we're collaborating on, uh, you did that directly through the web interface, and, and uh, it took you just a couple of seconds to do that. Um, not that it would take much longer uh, to do that. Um, I want to go back and talk a little bit more about Jenkins, because I think that it's something that uh, bears a little bit more uh, more talk as just a, as a continuous integration tool. Um, so uh, Jenkins does a couple of different things, and, and, and mainly I think that the, the main way that, that we would talk about using it is it's a service that usually runs on a, on a server um, external to GitHub, and and it would sit there and watch a GitHub repository, watch a webhook, and once that uh, once that webhook triggers, then it would run a predefined series of events, right? That's right, and and um, you'll find Jenkins and lots of other tools. You mentioned Circle CI, Drone, um, and, and there's definitely others out there. Uh, they all have GitHub integration, so. Um, GitHub integration is so popular uh, that, that you'll find it in almost any of those tools. But, but yes, that's that's exactly what Jenkins is doing with GitHub integration. And you know, there's also even tools to say, here's my company's organization on GitHub. If you ever see a repository, add it and run tests on it. So people use it for all kinds of automation and orchestration beyond just software testing. But um, but, but yeah, the beauty of it with GitHub, and really a lot of these tools with GitHub, is how easily integrated they are. Um, CircleCI that you mentioned, all you have to do is say, I'm interested in this project on CircleCI, and if it's a public GitHub project, it will go and run the test for, for an open source project. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to pay for anything. It's just all these tools that, that integrate so well. Yeah, good. yeah. And, um... You mentioned testing as well, so that would be one of the things that would be inclu included in the uh, list of instructions that you sent to Jenkins or to uh, Circle CI drone, whatever. Is is it some type of a testing uh, series that would go through and, and make those tests and say, hey, well, this broke everything, let's not do that, or hey, yeah, this is good to go, and they spit you out a report and tell you that it's good. That's right, and there's even um, I've even seen scripts where uh, so Jenkins, the software project, uses a Jenkins script where when you submit an improvement or an enhancement or a bug report, they actually comment back in that part of GitHub that's social where you can comment on 
stuff on different parts of the code or on submissions, and they say, "Hey, your message about what you changed here needs to point to a bug." If until you do that, I'm not going to test your code, right? Oh. So there's 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 all kinds of really nice integrations you can do uh, with Jenkins. I think we've just uh, determined where uh, Skynet's going to start is when when you uh, when you submit a bug about uh, Jenkins testing itself and it says ah, I'm not going to let you do that. That's right, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And another favorite I'll mention just while we're on the topic uh, that came out I think last year uh, was called Gitter, which was actually uh, an add-on for GitHub where. Uh, any public repository had a public chat room. And um, I discovered it because somebody went to a repository in GitHub that I maintain and tried to use the tool. And the tool emailed me and said, hey, someone wants to chat about your software project. And fully integrated with GitHub in that really, if you could say hashtag 22, it makes a link to issue number 22 or, or uh, you know, you point to a line of code and it summarizes it right below that in the chat. And so that's a really cool tool to, to check out as far as, um, as far as open source projects is you'll find chat rooms that are directly attached to GitHub repos. And it's as simple as, yes, I'd like to use this tool. Um, so really, really neat. Uh, there's a ton of these integrations coming out. There's ones that do everything, like I said, from chat to testing to code coverage, uh, looking at how much of your code is tested, to other kinds of analysis. Uh, yeah, and even GitHub does a few types of analysis. They've got some really cool um, analysis of what types of languages are popular and things on their repository. So really, GitHub, the, the social aspect and being to, in, to integrate it with other things is, is a huge part of what its popularity, I think. Yeah, certainly. I, I know that it's uh, really the glue that uh, uh, ties a lot of projects together, so that's great to see. Um, yeah, that was Gitter.im. Uh, Tyler just showed it for us, and then uh, uh, looks like uh, Vishnu uh, mentioned it as well in there. Um, we had a couple of other questions I want to really get to get a chance to answer here. Um, uh, this one's a, a pretty simple one. Uh, Skip wants to know if there's a, a lifespan on projects and if uh, GitHub goes through and purges projects after a certain amount of time. I don't, I don't think there is one. Uh, is there? Or is as far there as I know, possibly? I don't believe so. I mean, I've seen projects there from the beginning that have, say last commit three years. I don't believe they will do that. Uh, the, the one caveat to that is you can purge your own. So you may see repositories disappear because the users delete them. Um, but, but yeah, I don't know that they've ever purged any projects. I can't tell you, in addition to that uh, story about how I said, hey, I'd love to do this, and I go and I find a project, I've also said, hey, I'd love to do this, and I go and find a project with no files in it. So <laughs> that totally happens as well. So I, I don't think they're purging quite anything yeah. yet. Uh, maybe when they get up to more than 25 million repos, maybe when they get to 50 or something. But um, Git is pretty pretty economical as far as what it uh, costs and resources to store some of this stuff. So I would be surprised if they purge any. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where it's um, yeah, it doesn't take much at all. This uh, file that we're collaborating on, this individual file is 3.3k. So um, you know that's not uh, not eating up any uh, any space there at all. Um, so, so that's good. And, and this is really meant to work on text files too. I mean, you'll, you'll find some that will have uh, repositories that will have assets in them. You know, they'll have um, some of the you know sprites and, and iconography and things like that that go along with it. But um, you know, even now you're starting to see a lot of um, a lot of projects that will rely on um, on uh, assets stored in a CDN, you know, you look at like Font Awesome or something like that that a lot of people are using to to create icons on websites, and so they'll they'll really lean on that. They'll lean on um, uh, Bootstrap CDN if they're putting something into Bootstrap or whatever they're um, you know uh, trying to put something together, and, and they they kind of lean on these other um, uh, these other uh, uh, frameworks that are that are stored online and stored in in people's CDNs and uh, that keeps the actual amount of um, uh, content that you have to download whenever you first clone or fork a, um, a a project and it keeps that to a minimum so it's not as uh, taking up as much space. 
It's great. That's right. And GitHub even has some of the features to view some of those file types from within it from the web. So you know, I think it even support things like, supports things like Adobe RAW image formats and all of the usual standard JPEG, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but it, it can view a lot of different formats uh, mm -hmm. now just directly too. So even if you're not editing text line by line, um, it's got some nice viewers for that. And I think the repository you've been demoing has an image in it on the front page. And that's something nice too. You could put an image in your repository, write some of that markdown, and then actually display the image in the formatted text. So, uh, so that, there you go. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, that's in there. So there's a couple of ways that you could do that in the markdown. You could uh, reference a an externally hosted image, right? That's already publicly accessible, or you can reference, um, uh, you know, you can just reference the uh, image locally, right? So it uses a relative link uh, to jump to it. And you know, kind of speaking of that, another uh, project that I worked on was this getting started with Rackspace Guide. Um, and so um, put it together, and so it actually jumps in between these different uh, GitHub, uh, different uh, directories on this repository, right? So um, I've got these individual chapters, and this is this is something that I put together that used a lot of. Um, it ended up being seven different chapters long, and it's got a whole bunch of different. Uh, content in here, and I, and I worked with a couple of different people to put this together, so it was nice to be able to have it all in one place and be able to jump back and forth between them, and, and it really allowed a lot of people to review this. Um, I was able to write it in Markdown, which is something I'm very comfortable with, and I can write pretty quickly in that in that regard, and um, was able to use it um, to, to show it to people before it was live on the uh, Rackspace community, which is where this lives, um, and, and then I was able to uh, incorporate some other people's um, uh, edits and, and comments. So that was nice. And this might be a good spot to mention that uh, one of the other features of GitHub is each repository can have a wiki as well. So um, you know, even if you're not doing markdown documents in the code repo, you can actually have a wiki attached to it and deep link into the code and back and forth. And that's a really nice uh, feature I definitely I've seen that. Um, I used that the other day. Facebook has a couple software projects up there, and uh, they've got some really detailed, thorough wiki pages on them. So uh, some people even use that uh, wiki feature. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh, yeah, it looks like uh, Tyler's uh, showing the uh, some ways to do Markdown. Again, GitHub has a couple of great tutorials that I recommend everybody take a look at. Uh, we'll link to all of those in the in the notes that we have here. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, uh, yeah. So it, great tutorials, just on you know what's what's out there and uh, the the basics of using GitHub. There's a um, just a Git tutorial. It's actually an interactive one where it gives you the command line, so you learn how to do it on the command line, so you don't have to use the uh, either the great. Um, you know, you you mentioned the great uh, Windows interface. There's a, another really good Mac interface. I don't know if there's anything yet uh, out there for, for Linux yet, of course, but uh, there's a couple, you know, all developers use uh, use Macs, so that's all you need. But <laughs> There's a few, actually. There's a few. I think uh, Git K, there's a, there's a few that are uh, for, for Linux as well that help when you have a lot of history to look through. Yep. Uh, so they're out there. Um, there's definitely things out there um, that are available. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, let's see. Oh, hey, we got another couple of questions. Let's get these answered here real quick. So, uh, Skip asks if Rackspace is hosting GitHub. Yes, yes, we are. Yeah, I believe that's right. I don't know how much of their infrastructure uh, we've got, but I know that they're a customer. They are a customer. Uh, they they had a blog post from oh I don't know a while ago, probably six years ago, whenever they first moved over to Rackspace. It's a really interesting read on why they uh, chose to move their infrastructure over here to Rackspace and. Uh, Recommend you take a look at that. And then another question from uh, Vishnu, GitHub versus Bitbucket. Let's talk a little bit about that. That's another uh, uh, relatively popular option there. You yeah, um, I, I don't use Bitbucket a ton myself, but when I work with uh, some of our customers I have, and um, I know that there's a little bit of different feature set uh, between them that um, makes some customers uh, want to use that instead. And, um, really, from the perspective of things like the Git command line client or um, when we write automation around Git, uh, 
where it's hosted is pretty, it's, all those tools are pretty agnostic to that. Um, so I would say, you know, try, try Bitbucket, try uh, GitHub. There's a few host your own ones that are a little more tricky to set up. Um, you're probably in for a little more time with those, but um, yeah, that, that's another great thing about, about Git and GitHub is that even if GitHub completely changed their feature set, um, that there's a couple different sort of platforms on top of it now that are integrated with it, and and you know, I, Bitbucket is definitely a popular one. So I would say check them out, see if see what's a better fit for you, especially if you've got private um, private code you don't want public. Often that's the differentiating factor is is price. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely true. Um, is Bitbucket a Git repository? Does it work with is a Git the underlying technology there? Do you know, or is it something? I believe it's Git. Um, I, I think unlike, uh, actually similar to um, GitHub, and this might be interesting to some of our uh, people tuning in, is that it actually I believe there's a there's a Git SVN tool, and then there's also some ways to sort of use GitHub with other uh, repositories. But I think Bitbucket supports more. Um, that, from what I remember, Bitbucket supported more. It, okay, it supports Mercurial as well. So um, that may be another differentiator for people. But um, but I know also GitHub and and even uh, the old sort of the old guard SourceForge I think now hosts Git uh, repositories as well, um, and and also Subversion and I think still CVS, but I think they're trying to phase it out. There you go. There you go. Well, great. Well, uh, Martin, we're just about out of time. Uh, we could have probably uh, spent a, even more time talking about this. There's so much to cover. Um, I, I, again, thank you for, for joining us. It's been uh, super educational. Uh, let me make sure we haven't missed anything here. Um, oh, there was one. Uh, we have one here. Let's see. Ah, okay. Um, so this is a question from Daniel. Uh, it's uh, Daniel asks, is there any way to make a non-racker, say a customer or a fellow developer, access, even if just read-only or clone, uh, any of your internal repos in any way? Uh, so the, the way that usually happens is um, a private repository on public GitHub is the way I see that the most. Um, I don't know if they're what the official policies are. I know that um, you know if Rackspace has a business right. relationship with you, there are things we can do to get you access to some parts of of the infrastructure for for what you need to to do business with us. But uh, I think the most common way is probably to uh, have a private uh, organization in in public GitHub and add rackers to it and add. Uh, customers and um, we definitely do that on the DevOps automation service. I'm a member of a couple different customer repos. Um, often when I'm writing automation and I need to make sure some software deploys correctly, I might need to see the first few lines of it um, or I might want to be able to check it out myself and look at it to make sure to test my own automation work. So um, I think that's the most common way is uh, is keeping it in public GitHub and in a private repository or a public one if it's open source or something like that. Yep. And then you mentioned earlier that there are some uh, read-only options that are that are out there, so you can kind of expose or, or show off some of it without necessarily giving anybody uh, edit access. That's right. That's right. And in fact, like I definitely um, all the time I see with various uh, companies that have a public GitHub presence. Um, they want my contributions, but maybe not to every piece of software they've ever written that's on GitHub, which kind of makes sense. So uh, GitHub has the concept of teams, and you can grant access to teams. So you can put that third party on a team and attach it just to a particular set of re repositories and, and let that uh, person outside the organization just work on those. So that's, that's a very common uh, tool for controlling access, too. Great. Great question, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, all right. So, hey, we are at the end of this, uh, but uh, we are more than happy to answer questions uh, uh, beyond this. So uh, hit us up. Well, we both got our 
uh, Twitter handles there. We're more than uh, happy to engage with you that way. Um, if you are interested in uh, some of the things that Martin uh, gets to do with customers and, and help them to automate their, uh, their infrastructure and, and, and pushing that code onto infrastructure and uh, looking at infrastructure as code, which is just some of the, some of the neatest things that we're doing with any of our customers, uh, check us out. There's, um, uh, we'll put a link in, uh, in the uh, show notes about how to contact uh, Rackspace to talk about uh, moving, your, uh, moving over to our DevOps office. Uh, feel free to uh, contact us about that. Um, it's been it's been great to uh, great to chat about this. Uh, we do this every week, so um, we will uh, be back again on uh, next Thursday at one central time. And uh, again, just uh, thanks to everybody for joining us, and see you next week. Bye bye.